Hi, Sam Roberts with you for Pro Raster Scientific version 2.3.0. So today I'm going to give you a tutorial on uh, all the new features in version 2.3. Um, so use the chapter system to jump to the point uh, that you're interested in to get a, a, an in-depth dive into that particular feature. So all of the uh, new capabilities uh, are accessible via the right-click menu so that when you right-click in a map, or whether you're in the preview map or in an external map, <coughs> uh, you'll get a new context menu. So this is the map menu. Uh, and over on the workspace tree, if you right click on an item in the workspace tree, uh, you'll get uh, a new workspace, well, I should call it the algorithm tree. You get a new menu there and uh, you can access options there. So let's take a look at the map first. So firstly down at the bottom you'll see that there's a tooltip menu and there's a zoom to menu. So these are duplications of the existing tooltip buttons up here. Uh, and the zoom to button up here. You can just access that now from the map and um, in future I'll probably remove those buttons from the main dialog. <coughs> so let's look at these four uh, new map navigation modes. First mode is the pointer mode. This is what we've always had. So um, use the mouse wheel, roll in to zoom in and roll out, roll down to zoom uh, out. Um, left click, hold and drag to pan. So that's the pointer mode. Um, we now have a zoom in mode, this is a marquee zoom. So left click, hold down, drag and you'll drag out a rectangle to which you can then zoom. Or you can just click once and it'll zoom in by a factor of two. You can still zoom in and out using the mouse wheel. Also, if you hit the control key and hold it down, you can then um, pan just like you can in pointer mode. So control key down, left click, drag and pan, and, uh, and that gives you the pan. Uh, there's also a zoom out mode. It's exactly the same, except that it zooms out. And if you click, it will zoom out by a factor of two. And again, hold the control key, left click down, hold and drag to pan. Finally, there's a pan mode, uh, and uh, you just use the left mouse hold drag to pan around. You can zoom in and out with the mouse wheel. Now, with tooltips, um, there's uh, differences in each mode. So if you go to pointer mode, you get a tooltip. If you go to any of the zoom modes or the pan mode, you do not get a tooltip. So that's the, the major difference. So you want to stay in pointer mode most of the time because you want to uh, get that, um, that tooltip. Um, but the advantage of being able to zoom in with a marquee zoom is that you don't go through all the intermediate levels. So it doesn't load data uh, as you're interactively zooming in. Like that, for example, we're loading all the data as uh, at different levels of the of the overview pyramid as you zoom out. Right, so uh, let's look at the distance tool. Um, and I'll just turn that tooltip off. So left click, hold and drag and that will drag out a line and we're going to measure the distance along that line. And you can see that there's a tooltip being displayed. Um, it's giving you the map distance and it's giving you the earth distance. And in both cases, uh, it's also telling you the units in which it's um, presenting that distance. So, uh, and then once you release, that's the end. And over here, you'll see uh, on the algorithm uh, property set of property page, pages, there's a report page. Uh, and you can see that map distance and earth distance reported there in that page. So what's the difference between these two things? So the map distance is the distance between the two points along that line measured in the units of the map. Now, um, in this case, I'm using a geographical coordinate system, so units are in degrees, and that's not a very useful um, distance unit. Um, if you're going to measure distance on a map, you're going to want a projection that's suitable 
for measuring distance, so you want an equidistant projection. In this case, I don't have that. Um, but in addition to the map distance, it also reports the Earth distance. So this is the great circle distance on a sphere with the radius of the Earth uh, between these two endpoints. And it reports that here as 1,491 kilometres. So that line doesn't actually follow that straight line. It follows a great circle along uh, the surface of the Earth. Um, if you're looking at some other spherical body, if you're on Mars, for example, then you can take that distance and divide it by the, the Earth's radius, which I've used 6,371,000 metres, and then multiply it by the, the radius of Mars, and that will give you the distance on Mars rather than on Earth. Now, you can also do a polyline. So click and release, drag, click and release, drag, click and release, drag, click and release, double click, to end the polyline. Um, same deal, it's going to compute the distance along this polyline between all these sectors. It will also compute the great circle distance between each one of these sectors and report the sum of that distance as the Earth distance. <clears throat> so uh, that's the distance tool. We also have an area tool. And in this case, we create a polygon. It can be convex or it can be concave, but it's a simple polygon. It doesn't have uh, islands or, or holes. Um, so double click to end your polygon. Um, and it gives you some information here in the port report. So as we're creating our polygon, uh, the tooltip just gives us the map area. So this is computed in the units of the map, and here it's square degrees. And as before, that's not very useful. But if we go to our report that it then gives to you, uh, it also reports, in addition to the map area, the earth area and the equal area. So the earth area is a bit uh, is a 2D equivalent of the great circle computation for distance. So in this case, we are working out um, the percentage of a unit sphere that is covered by that polygon uh, using the latitude and longitude coordinates. And then you scale up that surface by the radius of the Earth. Um, so that's being reported there. If we come down here, it's 875,000 square kilometres. Um, again, uh, with the... With the Earth area, if you're looking at some other um, planetary body like Mars or something, then you can make an adjustment for the radius. So in this case, it's 2D, so you need the radius squared. So you divide by the radius of the Earth squared, 6,371,000 metres squared, and then multiply it by the radius of the body that you're looking at uh, squared. <clears throat> So that's an easy way to adjust that Earth area. Um, there's also an equal area um, reported. So in this case, uh, we're taking our, um, our polygon uh, in the coordinate system in which it was drawn. Uh, we're converting the coordinates into an equal area projection. We're using a Lambert azimuth equal area projection. That projection... Um, is designed for this polygon in particular. So we find the center of the polygon and we use that as the, um, as the, the center coordinate for the projection. And, um, and then having converted the coordinates into that equal area projection, we then compute the area of that polygon. And you can see that that gives us um, a, a value here. So this was 882,000 square kilometers, whereas the Earth... Um, or spherical um, area solution was 875,000 square kilometres. So there are multiple ways to uh, skin the cat um, with area. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can, you can make the projection of the map um, something suitable. So if I go to here and I change the projection to um, uh, Lambert Azimuth or equal area for Australia, so now... If I look at my 
um, coordinates, they're now in Eastings and Northings. Um, now I'll create my polygon. And now my map area is coming out as 929,000 uh, square kilometres. I think that's right. And, um, and then looking at the equal area, that's also 929,000 square kilometres. And the spherical area was 930,000 square kilometres. Uh, so that's area. Now let's look at the profile. Um, so with profiling, it's just like um, drawing a polyline in the distant in the distance tool. So uh, left click, hold down, and drag, and that will create a single straight line profile. Alternatively, click and release, drag, click and release, click and release, click and release, and then double click to create a polyline along which that profile is drawn. Um, so there are two different modes, single profile mo mode and multiple profile mode. So in single mode, you draw, let's just go like that. One profile, you draw another one, it replaces it, another one, it replaces it, another one, it replaces it. Now you can see that the profile is being rendered down here um, on top of the map, and it's semi-transparent on top of the map. So we have some information printed on the profile. Firstly, the, the minimum value, this is the, um, the, the vertical value that's been extracted from the raster. Secondly, the maximum value, the range of those values. So here we're looking at terrain. So we've gone from 190 metres to 996 metres in that particular profile. Well, let's draw another one across there. We're going from almost zero to 929, range of 928 metres. And the x-axis is distance, and our distance along that profile was 131.79 kilometres. Um, now, uh, the, the way that the profile is drawn, the sense in which it is drawn, is the sense in which you created the profile line. So if I drag a line across here, you can see that, um, that, that the profile is drawn from where I started the line to where I ended the line in that direction. So in this case, roughly sort of west to east. On the other hand, if I drag it the other way, now the profile goes from uh, east to west. So in other words, it's following the direction that you drag the line. So be careful about that. Um, just uh, some information on how to tailor the look and feel of this profile. So right click and go to the settings on the profile menu. So you can align it to the left or the right, to the top and the bottom, and you can make it half the width of the, of the map or the full width of the map, and you can make it a quarter height of the map or a half of the height of the map. So if I go top, full width and half height, then I get uh, this big profile up the top here. Um, now also, um, there are some elements in this profile that are drawn using pixels. So the thickness of this line and the size of this text, and these are all um, measured in pixels. So if you have a very high resolution monitor, then you uh, may want to adjust the size of these elements. Uh, and that's available to you from the options dialog for the main, for, uh, for the main application. And there's something here called pixel scale factor. So if I make that two, um, and then we probably need to uh, reset. In fact, we probably need to open an, a new map. Maybe if I just do that. Whoop. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let me bring that out. Okay, so that's uh, it's now reset. And now you can see that um, my, my text is twice as big and my lines are twice as thick. Uh, 
so that option is available to you. If you find that it's a little bit too coarse, you can put in um, an, a floating point scaling factor here. So you can you know, put in 0 0.8 and that will just scale it down to 80% of what it would normally be. Right, so continuing with profiles. Um, zoom in a bit here to the Flinders Ranges. Now, um, when I draw a profile, you get a comprehensive report. So let's draw a single profile. Uh, and let's say that I'm going on a, a, a hike, and I start here at the uh, campground, and I hike up to St. Mary's Peak, and I come back around, and I return to my campsite. So there's my profile. Um, now over here, it gives you a comprehensive report on that journey, and, and this makes um, most sense for terrain data. So the interesting, so the things to note are, firstly, it tells you what raster was the source of the data, uh, and the field and the band and so forth. It tells you the, the map distance and the earth distance along that polyline. Um, it gives you the some summary statistics for the data for the elevation along that line. So we can see our minimum, our maximum, uh, the range of values. We've got the mean, the median, and the mode, the standard deviation, and then also the skewness of that distribution. Um, and then it goes on, and it tells you that the total amount of ascent that you're going to make is 678 metres over a distance of 6.8 kilometres. Uh, it then gives you some... Uh, information about the ascent angles. So we're getting some uh, summary statistics for the ascent angles. So our, our smallest angle is very small, but our steepest ascent is 42.3 degrees. Our mean angle is 5 degrees, median and mode. Um, and then it tells us how many times we're going to be ascending. So we're making 47 individual ascents uh, over this entire walk. Um, the minimum length was 43 metres. The maximum length is 1,075 metres. And also gives you the mean and the median and the mode. Um, and then <clears throat> the, uh, the total ascent, minimum, maximum, mean and medium and mode. And then uh, it gives you the same information for your descent. So we've made a total descent of 679 metres over 7.7 kilometres, and so it goes on. Uh, so there's some comprehensive information there uh, that you can examine to um, if, you, if you're doing, particularly with terrain, um, when you're looking at uh, planning a, a walk or a journey of some kind. All right, um, let's look at now multiple profiles. So now I can draw multiple lines and they don't go away. And you can see that the profiles all get stacked here in the profile view. If I want them to go away, I can hit clear profiles and then I can start again. Now, by default, it's plotting distance. So they're all getting plotted from zero distance, the end of the line here, uh, out this way. So they don't kind of line up. Um, and you can see that each one of them's an individual color, so you can tell the difference between them. Uh, if we go to profile settings, we can change the horizontal axis. So I'm gonna change it from distance to a projected distance. And I'm going to tick this on, show the projection system so we can see what's going on. So now, uh, it, this might be a little bit hard to see, but there's a little faint box around these four profiles that have been drawn. And there's a little red line down the middle here. This is the common baseline upon which, onto which all of these profiles are going to be projected. So, And then they're plotted um, as a sign distance along that common baseline. Um, and you can see now that that the hill all lines up more reasonably. 
because they're all being plotted and we've sort of drawn the lines perpendicular to the strike of, of that particular mountain range. So um, if I do um, a little line like this or at a different angle, it doesn't tend to change the, very, the system very much. The system is um, dominated by, well, is weighted by the length of the line. So when you put in long lines, that tends to dominate the strike of the, or the bearing of the projected baseline. Um, you can also control, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I'll keep this, but at the moment, um, the, the direction that you draw the line, the longest line, is the direction that the profile be, will be rendered in. So if I draw a long line through here from left to right, um, you can see that we've got the hill going that way. If I drew a longer line from right to left, you can see that the whole direction of the profiling system just changed the, because it's based on that longest line and we drew it from this direction down to the, uh, to the left. Um, so I'm not sure if I'll keep that feature. Maybe I'll just in future I'll base it on uh, making it always positive to the right, uh, to, or in other words, always going west to east, but we'll see. So that's uh, that's the projected distance feature. Um, also on the settings page, you can change the vertical axis scaling. So we can hit scaled, hit OK. Uh, and now our scaling factor is one is to one. Now this depends on the horizontal units of the projection and then also the vertical units uh, of the projection uh, of the data. Now, usually the vertical units of your raster data are simply not known. Um, if they are known, they will be displayed in the profile. So it'll say, you know, max 1,058 metres, if it knows that they're metres. If it doesn't know what they are, then you'll see nothing there. So in this case, it doesn't know whether they're metres or not. If you're going to display something at true scale, one is to one, it needs to know what the units are in both directions in order to equalise that scale. Um, in this case, it doesn't. It knows that it's got metres along the x-axis, but it doesn't know what its vertical uh, units are. They happen to be metres, so one is to one works perfectly well. Um, but if you've got data that's in feet or some other vertical unit, you're going to have to adjust this scale factor um, to get that to display correctly at one is to one if the system doesn't know that the units are feet. And of course you can put in anything in here and, and scale it up as you see fit. Um, now just one other thing about profiling. Uh, so let me, um, have we got, uh, uh, there it is. No, not that one, sorry. I should be more professional, that one. Okay, so we've got a algorithm here that has multiple different layers in it and multiple different, um, multiple different data sets. So we've got uh, bathymetry, we've got terrain, We've also got uh, some mapping on the top. So if I go profile now and I draw a profile, you can see that our minimum is 25, our maximum is 253. In fact, it's taking the profile data from the mapping, from the, 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 the street map imagery. And that's in grayscale, so we're seeing values between 0 and 255. Okay, so that's not, that's not useful we actually want to draw a profile across the terrain. So you can do that by making sure that you select um, the, uh, the raster from the, work, from the algorithm tree. So I'm going to select the terrain here um, and, um, and then I'm going to clear the profile. You have to hit clear profile. Now it's going to reset to whatever is selected in the tree. Now I drag a profile and I get the terrain data. If I draw one out here, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, so I need the bathymetry now. So I'll select bathymetry, hit clear profile, and now I can draw a profile across the mid-Atlantic ridge, 
and, uh, and there's my bathymetry profile. Uh, so that's how you select what raster is going to be used um, to acquire the profile data. And you can check what raster is being used here in the report because it will tell you the name of that raster. In this case it's, it's a virtual raster which is then going back to uh, Jebco bathymetry. <clears throat> So I want to show you the changes in the workspace tree, in the algorithm tree now. And the biggest thing is um, layer grouping. So I'm going to take a raster and I'm going to drag it in and create a new algorithm. <clears throat> uh, so this is my um, Western basins. Uh, in this case, we're looking at geology. So um, this, these were originally... Um, GIS polygon uh, tables and um, they've been turned into classified rasters and all of the information has been preserved in these tables. So if you look around through this you can see that there's uh, 55 odd fields in the table um, with all these uh, various thing, information preserved, the age, all of the geological subsystems and so forth. So. So that's what we're looking at. Um, and now um, I've got uh, a number of these um, and, um, and some of them are provinces, some of them are basins and some of them are origins. And I want to um, group those things together. So over here, let's rename my algorithm. So it's New South Wales Geology. So once you're working with uh, grouping, you're going to want to name things. So if I right click on the algorithm, you can see that I've got options so I can add a layer um, and that's a duplication of this add layer button. Or you have this option for start grouping layers. So this is something that you turn on and off and it's off by default. So I'll hit start grouping and, um, and it adds a new group and my existing layers go into that group. Let's name the group. You're going to want to do this all the time. So our group is called basins. Um, so now I can bring in my other data. So here's my... I'm going to add this to a new layer. I've selected the basins group. So it's going to go into uh, that particular group. So that was the uh, Permo-Triassic basins. Um, here's the Great Australian Basin, add that to a layer, and we'll call this Great Australian. So now I have uh, three basins. I can turn these things off and on, just zoom out, um, just by clicking on the group itself. So if I turn the group off, all of the layers in the group get turned off as well. So let's now add another group. So I'll right click on the algorithm and say add a new group. And this group is going to be my origins. Origins. Come on, brain. I'm going to select that and then I'm going to drag in an origin and it will go in under that layer. So this one was my Thompson. Um, let's add in the New England origin. And let's add in um, the Lachlan origin. And so it goes on. Um, and finally, we'll just add a new group, and this will be our provinces. And let's add in the um, Cenozoic Sedimentary Province. And we'll just call this Sediments. Um, so now you, see, you can see that I have three groups with a number of layers in each group. So I can 
do a number of things. So, for example, I can move groups up and down. Now you can use these buttons here, or you can right click and you say move group up. Turn off the provinces, and now we've got our basins on top. Or if we move our origins on top, then the whole view changes. Um, you can delete the group, you can move the groups up and down. Uh, within a group, so let's turn these ones off, we've got our basins. Um, we can move layers up and down, so I can move layer down here, that moves it down a little bit. Or if I want, I can move layer to a different group, in this case I can move it up to the group that's above. And so my Thompson origin, oh, sorry, my Permo Triassic Basin is, is now up there in the origins section. Well, I don't want that, so I'll move it back down again. <clears throat> so uh, when you're moving groups, these buttons, ref sorry, when you're moving layers, these buttons refer to layers. When you're uh, on a group, these buttons refer to groups. So uh, let's turn that one off and just go to origins. Open up this one. Now, you can copy properties between layers. Um, and if you right click on uh, a layer or on a component, if I right click on a group, I don't get any copy. If I right click on a layer, I get these options. So I can copy to all layers in the group, copy to all layers in the algorithm, or if I I've clicked on a layer of a particular type, like an image layer or a RGB layer or a LUT layer, then I can copy it to layers of that same type in the group or in the algorithm. Now, what properties will get copied? Well, it depends on uh, which property page you have selected. So we're not copying all the properties of a group or a component. We're only going to copy those, property pa those uh, properties that are within the property page that's currently displayed. So for example, I might want to turn on some hill shading. So I come into this particular one, uh, I choose a terrain, I turn that on. I might want to adjust the shadow, I don't want this highlight on. And I might want to bring that scale down a bit, so it's not quite so, um, not quite so strong. Okay, so I've, I've change that one layer in this group. Now I want to copy that to all layers in this group. So I can write, so firstly, I need to copy all this uh, raster source data. So I copy to all layers in the group. And that's turned on intensity for all of the layers in the group and populated the um, and populated the uh, the raster source. Now I want to make sure that the shadow properties are all the same. So I go to the shadow property page, right click and go copy to all layers in the group. And now you can see that all the shadow settings have come out the same. So that's how you copy properties um, between layers and between groups um, in an algorithm. Now you can um, stop grouping when you do, all of your layers just simply have no group and they line up as they would in previous versions. So here's my um, New South Wales geology algorithm that I prepared earlier. And I want to demonstrate to you now image swapping. So if I right click, you can see this option called swapping, currently disabled. And you have options to flip, fade, slide or scroll. And you can swap layers or by toggling this, you can swap groups, and it now says that I'm swapping groups. Um, so uh, this is a hardware supported feature that uh, swaps imagery out uh, as you give the commands to do so. If I turn on swapping, and we'll just do flip. So now, uh, and we're swapping groups, and you can see in our algorithm that we have three groups. We have our provinces, our basins, and our origins. So if I come over to this and hit the left and right arrow keys, um, it will immediately flip to the next group, and it will display all of the layers in that group.
as I switch through. And as this is hardware supported, you can do it very quickly and, um, and there's no delay in flipping. Um, and then there are various other modes. So for example, we have the fade mode, uh, which will fade out of the current group into the next group uh, just over a period of half a second or so. And then we have a couple of uh, curtain modes where you can uh, draw or raise or lower the curtain. So here's the slide mode. Um, so on the one side we have our provinces and on the other side we have our basins. Now as you move the cursor around, as you go over the slider it will become activated and you grab it by this handle here and you can slide it back and forth and reveal uh, one group or the other. Um, we also have a scroll mode, in this case the the curtain is raised and lowered rather than being drawn and uh, you can go up and down. Um, now also uh, you can swap by layers, so if we change this to swapping by layers uh, we're now going through all of those, uh, what have we got, 11 layers in this algorithm. So we're going through one at a time in all of those layers. Now, um, whether you've got layers and groups turned on or off in the tree makes a difference. So if I turn off basins um, and come over here, now I'm not seeing any basins at all. So they are completely disappeared from, from our swapping, turn them back on, and then they appear again. So uh, there's the provinces, there's the basins. Uh, same, with, um, same with layers. So if we turn off the Lachlan orig origin and um, go through there, it was, well, it would sit in here and it's no longer there. So it's no longer being displayed. So you can do that uh, as you're flipping and um, oops, and if we come back, there's the lock on origin there. Um, you can do that as you're flipping, and it will uh, take account of what you've, uh, how you've set up, how you've enabled things uh, in the tree. Um, and uh, just another example, uh, more of a real world example. So uh, here's uh, Macquarie Island. Uh, the vegetation study that I did earlier. So in this case, um, we looked at vegetation from uh, 25 years ago and then vegetation recently. Uh, and, uh, and in the interve intervening period, they've removed all of the pests species like rabbits and rats and things. And they're looking at the, at the um, recovery of the vegetation. So we're looking at NDVI, so green is, is vegetated and brown is unvegetated. So if we use our scroll mode, we can uh, reveal the, the, um, the old data underneath where it was uh, quite degraded um, and then replace it with the new data where we're getting, as you can see, a lot more green in the NDVI. And um, and <clears throat> uh, and uh, much improved. And and with this kind of data, uh, rendering is relatively expensive because we have long processing chains, virtual raster processing chains that are um, bringing this data in. So to actually render will take a little while. Uh, and that's where um, this uh, this swapping can be quite useful because. Uh, of course, you've got very high performance. So if we go to scrolling again, now the rendering is caught up. Um, we've got the data rendered at high resolution and we're able to scroll through the um, degraded and then improved vegetation measurements for Macquarie Island. So uh, that is swapping. To turn it off, just hit disabled and um, uh, and I think that's all there is to say about that feature. So that's ProRaster Scientific version 2.3. Just a note on um, ProRaster Premium and ProRaster Essential. So ProRaster Premium um, does not have the distance area or profile tools, and it doesn't have the swapping capability. 
but it does have these these other uh, zooming tools um, and it does have the grouping capability in the algorithm tree uh, and ProRaster Essential doesn't have any of these new features but ProRaster Scientific has them all. Um, thanks for watching.